Jeff Goodman is the LeBron James of college basketball reporting. He is on Watch Stadium, several other platforms. He's got a podcast, Good in Plenty, which you should check out and download. He has been on ESPN, Fox, everything. He is at the top of the college basketball reporting game as far as a storyteller, a newsbreaker. Jeff is the guy, and we're glad to have him with us talking some UCLA basketball. Jeff, thanks for a couple minutes of your time. No, no problem, Brian. I hope uh, all is well. Thanks for the kind words. All that means is that I'm old and have been around doing this for a long time. That's all that means. All it means uh, is that you are unparalleled as far as how good you are at your okay. job. And you've had, yeah, and you've had, you know, conversations with a whole lot of college coaches and with the uncertainty of what's going on with coronavirus, when you take the temperature of these college coaches, what is their morale level like when they think about this season coming up and what it could look like? You know, I don't think it's as high as it was uh, even a few weeks ago, a month ago. I think, you know, as we're getting closer here, uh, you're starting to see some of the uh, test results in college football. And listen, the bottom line is college sports is going to be different than the NBA, than the NHL, than baseball, because uh, coaches can't keep track of where these kids are at all time. Where in the NBA, yeah. at least, you know, Adam Silver's got this bubble, right? And mm -hmm. in the NHL, they're making money. You can, you can keep track of them a little bit more than you can in college because when they leave you from practice, from training table, from whatever it is, you don't know who they're going out with, yeah. uh, where they're going, if they're going to bars or whatnot. So I, I think there's there's a significant level of concern and the uncertainty that if we don't have a plan, a plan A, a plan B, a plan C, uh, we're going to be left coming close to the season. And I think a lot of it goes back, Brian, to yeah. the fact that we don't have leadership in college sports. We don't have the NCAA. Nobody has confidence that Mark Emmert, and there's not a college basketball commissioner or anything like that. So a, a lot of it is just kind of let's wait and see. And, and that's not how this should be done right now. It shouldn't be let's wait and see. It should be what is the plan? Let's figure it out. Let's have a couple contingency plans uh, like probably some of the, the pro leagues have right now. I feel what you're saying, Jeff, because even in college football, there is not that uniformity, which during a time of distress is what you need. And in basketball, that's the same way. And that affects the, the outcome and the outlook of a season. So if you were to think, Jeff, what would it look like if more what would what would need to line up for you to suggest that we would have a full season on time? I mean, listen, I, I think, uh, you know, for me, it's football's got to go off uh, sure. without major hitches. And I just don't see it. Again, I, you know, we're, we're going to see it after July 4th where the Ivy League is going to make a decision on their football, uh, their league, and what they're going to do with football. And as we know, they were kind of the first one to cancel the, their college basketball tournament. So, uh, you know, I think we can all agree that the Ivy Leaguers are probably the most intelligent of, of <laughs> any of the – conferences so I would I would say like if I'm going to stand with one league and the decision they're going to make it's probably going to be the Ivy League and I, I just feel like we're setting ourselves up to fail here and it's going to be kind of last man standing when it comes to college football and it's whatever team is left playing at the end of the year because I think so many teams are going to say and especially not the SECs necessarily but some of the other ones are going to say is it worth it if you're Akron for instance, is it worth it if 10 players come down with COVID to lose the potential enrollment money of 100 people that say, I'm not going to send my kids to Akron because 10 players uh, have come down with COVID. So they're going to lose, you know, 100 times whatever it is at Akron or some of these schools, 50 grand. That's a lot more money than the Akron football program brings in. Uh, this isn't SEC football. SEC football is, is going to go down <laughs> fighting. They're going to do whatever they can do sure. to have football, period. So I, I guess to answer your question, there's just a lot of I don't knows with college hoops. But I think the first thing that has to happen is football has to get off the ground and, and do a pretty good job. And I, I would push back the college basketball season. I just think the more information we have at this point, the more time we have to potentially get a vaccine. Uh, gives us a better opportunity to have a college basketball season uninterrupted.
Yeah, I saw Rick Patino's tweet about this, and I know you were talking about this as well on Twitter, where he wants it to start up in January when you would get into the league and you would most likely, fingers crossed, have a vaccine. And not only could you play, but you could have fans. And I think that's another thing, too, which is so as important as you know, Jeff, is just having the fans around these college athletes is so important to what they're doing. And you think about where the stance is towards – students being on campus in the fall like there's the whole debate well if we're all online should we have a football season like or if it's hybrid is that okay where do you stand with that because some schools are taking it differently as far as who's going to be on campus who's not and whether that should impact whether sports are being played at least at the start in the fall yeah i mean i think if if, if you're a school that's going to have students in classrooms you might as well have sports Sure. Right? I mean, what's what's the difference at that point? But if you're a school that's going to bring everybody on campus, uh, try to charge full tuition and throw uh, uh, online classes their way. First of all, I think that's bullshit. Yeah. Uh, yeah. But, you know, as somebody who's paying right now private school uh, <laughs> tuition for my daughter in high school, sure. I hope I hope they don't charge me the same thing if it's full. Totally. Uh, you know, full online classes. Uh, but I, I think that's the hardest part with, with college sports is, right, that there's no u- uniformity, like you said, with the NBA, with the NHL, with all these leagues. They can do that. They can put it, but some schools don't have the same resources to do the same level of testing as others. Some schools are just willing because their programs are making more money to willing to go a little bit further than others. Uh, you're seeing a lot of schools right now, for instance, a lot of low and mid majors as I said, not bring their kids back for summer school at all, because number one, the cost of summer school and opening the dorms and all of that. Number two, again, the risk of having the players come down with COVID and hurting the enrollment numbers of the university. So it's twofold. So I think um, you've got a lot of, of inequality as far as potentially having, for instance, out your way, uh, UCLA, um, potentially not bringing their players back because why the, the you know, the governor doesn't want to maybe ramp up, um, you know, athletics, uh, obviously the, the rate, uh, in, in LA is a lot higher than it is maybe in Alabama. So you've got Alabama and the SEC already going hard, uh, with football soon and UCLA and some other areas, um, may not be at that point. So you've got kind of, again, kind of like what Donovan Mitchell said uh, on their conference call for the NBA. He, he said, listen, the bottom line is we got a lot of players with the Utah Jazz that have been living in apartments and condos, and they don't have access to private gyms like maybe a LeBron. He didn't mention LeBron and Kawhi, yeah. but, but it's true. So you, it's just an uneven playing field. So I almost feel like at some point, if you're Mark Emmert, don't you just say, hey, listen, here's the deal. Nobody can work out. No college basketball. Nobody can work out right now. Okay, you're not getting your two hours per week with your strength and conditioning coach. So be it. Everybody's going to be on the same playing field. So you think that he should kind of put the yeah. foot down and say yeah. when the actual practices begin, then we start. So all of the extra time, the couple of weeks now where it's not exactly – it's more voluntary stuff that he should just kind of – but does why doesn't he do that as far as your point, Jeff, to having that kind of competitive equality? I don't know. I don't know. I mean, they, they've said July 20th is the first day that uh, college basketball players can start to work out, right? And working out basically, again, means um, you get your, your couple hours with your, uh, you know, with your coaching staff. But a lot of coaches that I've talked to said they're not even going to use it. Like, look at Duke. Duke's saying we're not even bringing our our players back until early August because I think Coach K and Duke understand it's not worth the risk uh, to bring them in. To me, I would have the football team be kind of the test case and keep it as small as you possibly can on every campus and see if you can just get football off the ground first. Worry about that and then worry about basketball later. And again, if the quality of play sucks in November, so be it. At least let's just try to get college basketball. 
college basketball, obviously football. And then you have Martin Jarman taking over as the new athletic director for UCLA. And he's got a whole lot of different things to work on. I mean, his plate is very large when he took over, which was just like yesterday. I think July 1st was his first day. So if you're Martin Jarman, Jeff, where do you attend to first? Well, good guy, first of all. He yeah. was at Boston College here in my backyard for a few years and uh, finally made his first hire. I mean, came from Ohio State, makes his first hire, a football coach, uh, and, and it's crazy. I mean, crazy to think about that you don't even have to uh, make a big-time hire in one of the revenue sports, and you can still get a plum job, one of the best AD jobs in the country uh, at UCLA. Martin's really smart. Uh, he'll be able to raise money. Um, you know, I, I think – you know, here in Boston, he did a good job given the, the the restrictions that he had. Certainly, men's basketball tough. It's like the third sport uh, overall behind football and hockey. Um, it's a pro sports town. Um, similar, you know, listen, similar to UCLA in a lot of ways. Obviously, UCLA is a lot better program than Boston College, but ultimately, you got to find a way to get people excited uh, about UCLA sports. Uh, when it's a pro sports town and there's so many other things to do in both LA or Boston. So he, he's got a good way about him. He's good with people. Um, you know, I think he's just got to get some familiarity with kind of what's going on out there right now. And uh, the good thing is at least from a, from a basketball standpoint, I can't speak to other things. Uh, he, he's in good hands. He doesn't have to worry about getting a new coach out there anytime soon uh, since he's got McCrone. What do you, Ben, what have you been most impressed about Jeff with Mick Crone and, and his handling of the situation that he inherited and that what he was able to do with the pieces in place that first year? Yeah, I didn't think he, when he was hired, I didn't think it was like a slam dunk hire. I, I don't know if anybody did. I think everybody was like, all right, solid double. He's a hell of a coach, but how's he going to be able to do out in LA because he's recruited a bunch of tough you know, uh, lunch pail type guys as Cincy and really, really done a great job with those guys and, and with that program, um, kind of getting them back to where they were a national name. Um, but again, I, I, I saw them play Washington in Seattle last year. And oh, you were at that game with Jake Kyman? Oh my gosh. Kyman was out of his mind. I oh went my. afterwards and I'm like, Mick, like, how do you not play this dude? I get yeah. he can't guard me, but you need guys who can make shots. Who cares if you give up 15? <laughs> As long as he gets his 20, you just need somebody who's going to make shots. And I, I thought that was a big game for them. I, I really do. I think that, that started to turn around the season a little bit because going to Seattle, uh, beating a team with, with two first-round picks on the roster, uh, Quade Green was still on the court at that point. Uh, he was suspended and, and basically kicked off uh, a week or so later. It, it just kind of started um, them understanding that, you know what, if we buy in, to what Mick is selling us, and I talked to a couple of the players after the game, mm -hmm. then, then we got a chance here. And I think they fought it. And, and I think, again, you're, you're generally going to fight it with a guy like Mick who's going to come in and basically say, hey, listen, guys, it's my way or the highway. If you don't guard, you're not playing. You're not, you're not getting on the court. Uh, and even Kyman said that to me after the game. He said, listen, I realize I'm not the greatest defensive player in the world, but I got to give the effort. I got to get better, so I'm not a liability on that. What do you think, Jeff, the departure of Dacia Nix does going over to the G League and, and what that all was like? Because here he was committed, and then last second he bows out, gets some money, part of this upstart G League thing that they're, they've got working on. So does that affect the Bruins and to what level? Oh, yeah. No, no, no. It affects the Bruins big time. I, listen, I've always liked Tiger Campbell, and I, I always – maybe I have more confidence in him than most. Uh, you know, first half of the year last year, I was like, eh, he's probably a really good backup. And then second half, I'm like, all right, he can be a good starter. He's not like a front line, high, high level starter. But I think he's a guy that, again, proved, right? You can win with him at a high level as your starting point guard. But man, he would have been great with Knicks. He would have been great as a, like, Tiger Campbell is your backup. Then you're talking about a team. And Nick just makes people better. Like, he, he's got some Lonzo in him in terms of just wanting to make people better and facilitate and not worrying about his numbers, just worrying about winning games. And, and I think that was the thing that always blew me away and still does about Lonzo Ball. With all the bullshit he had to handle, right, with his dad. I mean, yeah. 
his dad never said a good word about any coach that ever coached Lonzo or any of those kids. Yet Lonzo still managed to, to stay above the fray and never say a bad word about any of his coaches and yet never say a bad word about his father. Like, so, so smart. Uh, and again, on the court, you could see it. I mean, what, is, what does Lonzo do? He just – he advances the ball. It's not dribble, 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 dribble like his younger brother who, who was all flash and sizzle. Yeah. And I, I think Nick's had some Lonzo in him. I do. I think he I, – I, yeah, I think it's going to hurt. I mean, I know everybody says, well, they bring everything back other than Prince, right? I mean, they bring pretty much everything back mm -hmm. uh, from last year. But I think Knicks was a huge, huge loss. It doesn't mean just because you bring everything back, you're going to pick up where you left off. I saw you, Jeff, reporting about when LeVar Ball had pulled out his kid at UCLA and just sort of the bad breakup. From what you know about that situation, how tough was that for both sides to deal with? When the you know, ball I was, was there. When the ball, yeah. I was there. I remember I went to um, – I interviewed LiAngelo in Pauly right before uh, his freshman year started. And the same day, uh, went over with the ESPN crew um, to Tino Hills and interviewed wow. um, LaMelo and Lonzo at that point. I think they were both there in LaVar. And um, listen, I knew the family pretty well. I mean, as well as you could know them with kind of seeing them uh, multiple times a year. Sure. Um, I, I just, I always said it. I just didn't think LiAngelo was very good. I just didn't. Uh, and, and I think they took LiAngelo to get LaMelo. And uh, obviously the whole thing that happened in, in, in China was yeah. um, that, that kind of started uh, it, it, it going out of control, right? And, and listen, uh, Alford had his hands full with LaVar even when, when Lonzo was there. So I think it was one of those things where at that point he would have liked to have been able to sever ties, but I feel like he, he yeah. just couldn't do it. He couldn't sure. Yeah, Leangelo, all he could do from watching that one preseason game at UCLA, he could hit a couple threes, but that was about it. I mean, he, he was like a liability on defense. He's a, listen, I was in Lithuania with them. He, he was, he's oh, a, a low to mid-level European player. That, that's ultimately what he is. And I don't know, I can't remember, did he sign with the G League? I think he's playing. At one point, yeah, I think I saw that, yeah. Yeah, yeah and, and, you know, again, you wonder if that's just a – goodwill to try to get Lonzo eventually or LaMelo, depending on what happens with him. And um, yeah, it, you know, it's too bad. It's too bad because I think LaMelo with good coaching for the last four years uh, would have been the number one overall pick. I really believe that. I think uh, the biggest problem is I think LaVar did him a disservice in terms of bouncing him around and not putting him with somebody that could really, really work with him and, and get him to understand, mature his game to mature, guard, uh, be able to know what a good shot is from a, from a bad shot. Again, I feel like he's kind of the opposite of Alonzo in a lot of ways, but man, he's got some of the, some of the same court vision and passing abilities as his older brother. The Ball family, their presence on social media is just, I mean, it's insane. I mean, the, the number of followers, the brand that they have, and I'm thinking about Jeff how the influence that they have, what that's going to do towards the original model of the NCAA and how players are going to be able to profit off their likeness. Guys like Lonzo, I mean, if he had that ability, I can't even imagine how much money he would have made in college. So where are you with guys like this that, you know, even – high school player like Mikey Williams these guys have thousands and thousands and thousands of followers and they could be capitalizing off their their platforms does the does the NCAA understand that and how far are they towards getting towards that yeah they're trying to figure that out and, and that's what they're trying to wrap their arms around right now and trying to get this implemented by January 2021 but we're seeing other states uh, like Florida trying to push this thing along a little bit and say hey listen if you don't do enough we're going to come in and, and do our own state law and push the envelope even more so what you need to do is and the NCAA has said we're going to have guardrails on, on some of the name image likeness uh, they've said they're not going to cap it but they're going to have guardrails what are those guardrails that's that's the big thing right now hmm. uh, are they going to let kids um, make money off their social media how much are they going to let kids 
I tweeted it to somebody yesterday. Think about it. If, if you're a kid at UCLA, right, and uh, and you want to have a party, a big house party, mm -hmm. and you want to charge people 25 bucks to come in the door and, and get 100 people in, well, why wouldn't you pay, I don't know, Tiger Campbell, whoever. I mean, obviously, Chris Smith, if he comes back, is a good example. Why wouldn't you give Chris Smith 500 bucks and just say, hey, Chris, we need you to show up for the night. I'll give you $500 to just come to this party yeah. and hang out. And you know what? Maybe I'll give you a percentage of whatever comes in on the door. You know, maybe I'll give you 200. And, and if we get in, you know, 200 more people, I'll give you five bucks for every person who comes in. Wow. Is that going to be allowed? Not allowed? So the NCAA, listen, to go back to what I said earlier, they're well-intentioned. They are. I mean, I think there's good people there. I don't think they ever wanted to get in this business and they were forced into the NIL business. Uh, but what are they going to do here I don't think a lot of people have extreme confidence that they're going to be able to figure this thing out, especially on the first try. I know I don't, but I don't have confidence anybody could have. I almost feel like the only way to get it right would have been just to say, you know what? It's open, boys. It's open. <laughs> Go get whatever you want. Yeah. And the market, I think the market, Brian, would, would ultimately auto, it would correct itself after a year because those who are paying the first year might say like, well, what am I paying here? Am I getting a return on my investment? And if I'm not, I'm not going to, if I'm a car dealership owner, I'm not going to bring in Tiger Campbell uh, or Chris Smith and pay them $50,000 to do an ad um, when it's just not worth it for them. I, you'd rather give that money to, I don't know, uh, Avery Bradley, yeah, something like that esteemed college basketball insider jeff goodman joins us you can follow him on twitter at goodman hoops i'm brian fenley you spoke about chris smith jeff what do you think is going through his mind right now and what should he do it's easy like this is an easy decision wait wait as long as you possibly can because i'd advise this to any kid right now who's put his name in for the nba draft and in fact they they, they pushed back the deadline the nba did for other kids to declare if I was any kid right now that had any shot of playing and making money overseas or, or being a draft pick, I would put my name in right now. And, and here's why, because to me, you want to wait till the absolute end, whatever that deadline is, I forget. It's like August, right? They got another month, month and change. Mm -hmm. See where we're at at that point. If it looks like at that point, we're not going to have college basketball. You want to already have declared. You want to have that option at least to pe potentially go overseas. Right, because if there's no college hoop, if you're Luca Garza, I'll give yeah. you an example. Luca Garza is probably going to come back. He's the best player in the country. Probably going to come back to Iowa. But if there's not college basketball this year, and you don't have a good feel for that uh, on the final day, again, whatever the date is in August that they announced that that is going to be the deadline to withdraw from the NBA draft, you keep your name in uh, if you don't have a good feel, and and you see what you can get overseas rather than potentially sitting here and then college basketball gets canceled. So I think you get, you may not have enough information by then, but to me, why not wait another month, month and change. And then if you're Chris Smith, make, make your decision at the absolute 11th hour. And that is a great perspective, Jeff. I like that. And wrapping up here with Jeff Goodman again, Jeff, thank you so much for, for doing this. Yep. Really, really appreciate it. Who do you think? As long think? as I was better than Gottlieb. That's all. Oh that my gosh. I was hoping you saw some. I'm going to post some yeah. more. <laughs> I did. Gottlieb's my guy, but, but you know, you can't hit, you know, hold a candle. Oh my gosh. We had some interesting conversations. And Jeff, I'm going to post more of that because I asked him about how close he was to playing at UCLA. And, you know, I know he had talked about that there was some mutual interest and why it didn't necessarily work out. But, and he's got all these ties to UCLA, too. He sure does. Yeah. No, he sure does. I mean, people – I feel bad for Doug. And, and I know, uh, you know, he's the type. He does read social media. And, and I get hammered. Listen, I get hammered for a lot of things that I'll tweet or whatever. But, man, that poor guy, like, every time he tweets something, you know, he gets somebody killing him for something he did 20 or some odd years ago. Yeah. And, and, and he's been completely transparent about it. Mm -hmm. It's like people just give it up, give yeah. it up. You know, does he make mistakes? Some of the things he'll tweet. Yeah, yeah we all do. We all do. But you know what? Doug Gottlieb works his ass off he and does. he isn't afraid to, to express his opinions. I would much rather that than 
the vanilla people out there right now who have information, who work, who are scared to express their opinions. Yes. Why? Because they want to kiss people's asses. Yes. That, that, that's the bottom line. They want more information or they don't want to offend somebody. No, I want to hear somebody like Doug Gottlieb because he is going to ex express his opinion. I'm going to get it real. Again, he and I are similar in a lot of ways. Obviously, he played at the highest level. There's a big difference. But we're similar in we work our asses off. We have opinions. We're not afraid to express them. And if you like us, great. If you don't like us, oh, well. Having that, because you are in the opinion business. I mean, you, that is exactly what you're paid for. And nobody wants to hear somebody that's lukewarm on an issue. Whether you're against it or not, you're going to be talking about it, even if you're against it. Jeff, how do you deal with all the social media trolls out there? I mean, a guy like you who's in the spotlight and having to deal with all of this, how do you push yourself away from that and not let it kind of get underneath your skin? I'm like Doug in a lot of ways. Like, I like the interaction. I don't mind it at all. I have fun with it. I don't take my job seriously. I feel like I've never worked a day in my life. I've been really fortunate uh, for that and, and, and been able to, you know, get paid pretty well doing something that a lot of people could do better than me, but I just got lucky um, into the business and, and decided I'm going to work my ass off so nobody's going to take my job. Um, but I think, you know, you've got to have a thick skin. And the more you do it, the more you understand that. And the more social media has been prevalent, you realize, like, whatever. Like, I tweet out, honestly, I'll retweet somebody that will make fun of me and do it creatively all day, every day. <laughs> but, but if you come at me with the same stuff, you're ugly, you have a face for radio. Like, I've heard that a hundred times. <laughs> that, that's not creative. But come up with something good. I love I'll it. I'll retweet it. The, the one thing that's been hard for me lately, Brian, is yeah. having a 16-year-old daughter who is starting to – she wasn't a sports fan, but she is now. Oh, cool. Starting to do interviews and stuff. And, yeah. Um, watching me, I guess. I, I'm shocked she ever watched anything I did uh, all, through all these years because, like I said, she didn't really like sports. But now she's on social media. And the, the, only, the only thing that I have is if you come at her, yeah. God help you. God help you. Because totally. I will find you. I will track you down. Uh, I will find out who you work for. And I will make <laughs> sure that they see that tweet. And yeah. if you get fired, I don't care. Yeah. Because you don't go after family. Come no. after me. Say whatever you want. Crush me. Call me any name you want. I don't care. You come after my 16-year-old daughter. Like I said, that's, just, yeah. that's bullshit. That's bullshit. It, yeah, it's game over. Yep. Well, last question for you. The best Bruin, in your opinion, in the 21st century, who is it? Uh, the best Bruin in the 21st century. Oh, since I started covering this. Uh, can I say my boy, Alfred Aboya, who I first saw at Tilton School? Oh, but, you, uh, oh my God, I love Alfred. Love Alfred. I saw him, I think I wrote the first story, I know I did, on Alfred Aboya when he first came over here. I was covering really? prep schools. Yeah, I was covering prep schools heavy. And a guy wow. named Scott Willard was the coach. Um, and I went up there and saw Alfred. And, man, salt of the earth. I haven't seen him in forever. Salt of the earth uh, type guy. Love Lorenzo Mata, another yes. kid. I, you know, I, I came up covering recruiting. So it's different for me. You know, I remember the first time I met Kevin Love at ABCD camp. He was like 15 years old. And there's a bunch of us there, maybe five, seven of us. And he walks away, 15 years old, mind you. He walks away after it all, and he looks at me, and probably not just me, and he says, hey, thanks for your time, Jeff. And I'm like, what? Like, you're 15. How do you – he was just so far ahead of his time in terms of dealing with the media, understanding how to play the media to some degree, right? <laughs> sure. I mean, that was Kevin. Um, and, uh, yeah, we, we, we actually – it's funny. He gave me a shout-out when he committed. He committed in Vegas to UCLA. He committed in a side – room at one of the events in Vegas and uh and and we haven't talked in years and I kind of feel bad about it um I don't know why I don't really know the genesis of it but I've seen him many a time when he came in with the Cleveland Cavs or when I was in Cleveland or saw mm -hmm. him on the road and uh and we don't really talk anymore and I feel bad about that I gotta try to reach out to him at some yeah time. I like a lot of Bruins man like a lot of really really good play love Jordan Farmar Aaron Aflalo, um, 
yeah, just a lot of really good players. Darren Collison and um, respect the hell out of Russ Westbrook, even though he's brutal to deal with from a media perspective. <laughs> yeah. uh, but but I love him for it. I love him for it because the one thing you can say about Russ is when they win, whatever team he's on, he's great and he stand up. When they lose, even even if he is forty, he is a miserable mf -er. miserable. Yeah. And I, I listen. That's all you want if you're a coach, right? Like, you just want a guy that wants to win more than anything else. And I respect that uh, from a media standpoint. Th that competitiveness. And I've heard stories from some of his former players at UCLA, just his dedication to his craft and how long he would be in the gym past midnight when nobody else was there just to get shots up. And how I think he averaged, what, Jeff, like nine minutes a game a as a freshman and then a lottery pick after a sophomore year. Just Who's absolutely. Who's your favorite Bruin? Who's your favorite Bruin? In Man. The 21st century? Gosh, that's a great guy. I've never had it turn back on me. So, you know, I. I like Josh Shipp, too. I was a big Josh Shipp fan. Yes. Yeah. I, and you know what? Uh, Josh. I yeah, I, had, I did Josh now. on him. on. I had, I had him on this little, this little interview thing. It was cool to see him. Yeah. And I know he, and he had, you know, all those injury issues and stuff that he had been working through. Gosh. Got nobody? I got, well, okay, here, the person that I know the best and, and is, I, I loved, I just thought, and I, I hope that he gets another chance, Jordan Adams. Yeah. You know, I, he was, you, I mean, Jeff, you saw how good he was with the ball in his hands and just how swift and the injuries come about and I, you know, I, I follow him on Instagram and I see that he's always working on his craft and I just, he's still good kind of kid too. Good kid. Just yes. made some mistakes. Just made a couple mistakes when he was in school that kind of cost them to have to leave earlier than he probably should have. Right. Sure. Yeah. yeah but I, I'm with you. Jordan Adams, a really good kid. You know, that's the hard part. You watch kids like that who, again, I've known since they were, you know, 16, 15, years old watching them on the AU circuit and you do you play the what if game a little bit mm -hmm. like what if they had stayed another year in college uh could he be playing in the NBA or at least gotten a contract and, and sure. you know and, and being able to take care of his family but you know what the other part is listen for some of these kids playing overseas isn't so bad going to a different it depends where you are but if you're getting paid and living in Italy or Spain or one of these really cool countries and you can do that for, for 10, 12, 15 years and not have to pay uh, taxes and have your house and your car paid for and save some of that money. Life isn't so bad. Jason Capono. I forgot. I wanted to mention him too. How fun was he shooting the rock? Oh, it was great. <laughs> I mean, again, like people forget how good UCLA was. You know, people want to talk more about the job, right? And it's not as good as it used to be. Obviously, it's not as good as when, you know, they were winning titles. Uh, under Wooden, but I, I still think, listen, there's been some really, really good players, some talent um, that has come through there in the last, you know, 15, 20 years. And ultimately the question will be, can Mick Cronin get them to where they're competing for final fours and not just competing uh, to get in the NCAA tournament? I, I think he will, because I, what I think Mick's going to be able to do, and I think this is something we all said when he got the job, is can you match the skilled softer type California kids yes. and get maybe five of those guys along with maybe seven tough MFers. Yes. Um, and find those guys that maybe weren't as highly recruited. And I think Darren Savino is one of the best assistants in the country. I, I do. He, he really needs to get a head job. I, I hope he's like the next head coach at Fordham. I, I think they should hire Darren wow. Savino. I really do. Uh, New Yorker, New Jersey, um, it would crush Mick because I think Darren's that good. Uh, but I, I think those guys, they're smart enough to figure out how to mesh the two, uh, the two together, the skilled, softer, talented uh, California kids uh, with, the, with the tough, hard-nosed ones that, you know, mostly you could still get in California, but maybe you got to dip outside of the state a little bit for, for a guy here or there. The, the transformation from – Alford to, to Cronin, it, it took months for these guys to buy in because Alford, you know, as many good years as he had, he was not a defensive guy and just kind of 
get in your face, grind it out. And you, you saw a lot of players just – their maturity levels changed a whole lot last year, Jeff, and you saw this. Just the way they handled themselves in front of the media and how – you know, they didn't pout as much and they realized that if they bought in and I know it sounds very cliche, but that good things would come about. Yeah, yeah. no, you're, you're, you're correct. Yeah. And again, I think it takes Mick a little bit of time and it takes players uh, some time to get acclimated to whoever the new coach is, especially when the styles and the systems are, are as different as they were under Steve Alford, who they kind of thrown in the towel with, let's be honest at the end there and, and Mick Cronin, who, you know, I, I always listen. I, I thought when they hired Mick Cronin and I still don't understand it, why they never went after Chris Beard. I still, to this day, don't get it. They never tried. And, and my take is Chris Beard might be the best coach in America right now. And you hired a guy that's similar in some ways. Mick's probably more suited for LA the beard, I don't think beard's suited for LA, but I think a lot of people when Mick got hired were like, well, he's not really suited for LA either, right? He's not an sure. LA guy, but I think Mick can pull it off a lot better than, than beard could. But they were both kind of defensive minded, tough, hard nosed, hold you accountable type guys. And I, I just, I was like, why wouldn't they have at least tried to, to see if they could get beard? Again, I don't think he would have taken it. I think he realizes he's probably not cut out for UCLA. But UCLA is also a tough, tough job to turn down mm -hmm. um, for anybody because of the tradition, because of the history. Because you know if you get UCLA back, we saw it for that one year with Lonzo, right? Mm -hmm. We saw how it captive – now, part of it was Lonzo too. But if, if, if you're really good at UCLA, they're going to come. And everybody's going to come, you know whether it's Jack Nicholson and, and <laughs> it doesn't matter. Every star is going to come out and watch UCLA if you're winning at the highest level. And, and I hope Mick can get that back. Speaking of stars, I think that Jeff Goodman would be on the, the front row there watching, watching UCLA <laughs> right next to Magic Johnson. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> Jeff, thank you so much. This was a whole lot of fun. I really appreciate it. You can follow Jeff on Twitter at Goodman Hoops. I'm on Twitter at Brian Fenley. And, Jeff, this was a whole lot of fun. No, I'm glad we did it, Brian. Yeah. Stay safe. And uh, hopefully we'll get a chance to, uh, to, to see each other at a game. Yes. Uh, here. That, that, that's the big thing. If we can do that, we're all winners, right? Yeah, yeah. We're going we're gonna to celebrate, you know, when we meet in person and, and get past this. It's going to be a big party. <laughs>